Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today, my guest is Marjorie Maddox, a wife, mother, and professor who has published 10 books of poems and directs the creative writing program at Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania. Marjorie was a Sage Graduate Fellow at Cornell University, where she earned her Master of Fine Arts degree and won the Robert Chason Prize for a linked series of verse. Since then, her work has continued to tell rich, important stories, with each poem contributing to a larger narrative. Her latest collection, titled True, False, None of the Above, explores what she calls the intersection of words and belief and how books mark and mirror our lives. Those themes also appear in her previous book, Local News from Somewhere Else, where she grapples with living in an unsafe world in the aftermath of terrorist attacks and other tragedies. In all of her writing, there's an undercurrent of hope and perseverance, a desire to connect with other people, and an awareness that the world is recreated each day, as many classic poets have told us. Marjorie has won multiple awards, and her poems have appeared in a variety of journals and anthologies, including Commonwealth, Contemporary Poets on Pennsylvania, which she co-edited. She has also published essays, fiction, two books for children, and she has taught workshops in public schools, challenging students to open themselves to poetry, which can enter in the front door or the back door, she says. I'm happy to have Marjorie here to talk about those ideas and how literature can inform and inspire readers, no matter what is happening in the world around us. Marjorie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So you have a poem that you're going to open with? I uh, was thinking about some of the things that we were going to talk about. and. This idea of how literature has to do very much with our day-to-day -day lives. And one of the, the poems that I'd love to teach in my introduction to literature class is Gerard Manley Hopkins' God's Grandeur. And even though it was written in the 19th century, I'd like to connect it to some of the things that the students are talking about today. And uh, their central Pennsylvania reality right now is the gas industry, fracking. Um, so we take the structure of the sonnet, which is a problem and a solution, and talk about how is Hopkins also talking about the things that impact their lives. So this is, and the topic for today is environmentalism, teaching God's grandeur. More politically correct than divine grandeur, it too flames out in this small Pennsylvania town where fracking hijacks the headlines. Good reason, and good enough to bring the state students trotting heavily into a poem piled high with God and earth, with responsibilities they hear each morning as the gas industry trucks rattle past our windows, their tired drivers knowing nothing of iambic pentameter or sestets, but much about food on the table, a steady job. The freshmen, eager now, blurt out dilemma paradox, in-stress, and all those other new-sounding ideas suddenly connected to their lives, their parents, the sonnet they think was written last week, even with its 19th century, sound-packed syllables they don't get until slowing down, thinking. And so, after playing with light, foil, sound, the way trade sears, blears, and smears, and how and why shoes separate us from ground. We detour to Genesis, Cat Stevens, and a heavy metal rendition that almost drowns out Hopkins with bass. All this before rounding the terrain raked bend to solution, which is what they are surprised to discover we all most want. The eloquent octet, the bright wings, the ah that opens the mind to talk, at long last about the holy. Mm. I love that idea about the ah that opens the mm -hmm. mind to talk mm -hmm. because that really gets at the aim of education and also one of the strengths of literature. So when you are teaching students, especially freshmen, how do you help them make those connections? Uh, well, I love to get them to think about 
um, what the lit what literature has to do with you know everything that they go through day to day. Their other classes, um, what they are doing with their friends, the things that they're struggling with. Um, and that awe is a, is a moment of epiphany, right, at the end, uh, where they are starting to understand everything that comes together. Um, it also ties into some of the other references into the poem about the, the, the Holy Ghost kind of brooding over the world in Genesis and that mm -hmm. Cat Stevens song, which is really the hymn, Morning is Broken and Things Being Recreated Every Day. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when we talk about this, we get to talk of this, this poem and God's grandeur, we get to talk about um, things that, that have to do with how does industry, you know, how does, uh, how does industry sear or burn the earth? Why is, uh, why is making something manufactured like shoes separating us from the ground? And what does that have to do with what they see happening in their communities, mm -hmm. you know, which are really issues for them? Mm -hmm. so. When students are in high school, mm -hmm. often they are expected to just learn information mm -hmm. and recite it back. And when they get to college, education is, is very different because suddenly they're mm -hmm. analyzing data, they're sifting through ideas, and they're thinking in broader, more abstract ways. Mm -hmm. How do you help students see that truth has a different shade or different meaning at the college level than it might have when they were in high school? Well, you definitely don't just want answers kind of regurgitated, regurgitated back, um, spewed back. You really want them to engage with the text. Um, mm -hmm. I encourage them that, you know, well, I tell them they can have any answer or response that they want. However, and I think it's a big however, they have to be able to back it up with evidence from the text. Mm -hmm. So they can't just be completely wild about it, but where can they find that interpret? Literary, you know, literary critics disagree all the time, but mm -hmm. how do you back it up? How do you, um, you know, talk about it um, with evidence from the text? Um, but they, they do need to think through these issues, and we, we have lots and lots of discussion, you know. So I don't stand up there and lecture. We get very involved, and we get to know each other very well. Mm -hmm. so. When we were talking before, you said that your role as teacher is not to answer questions, but pose questions and talk about a lot of different perspectives, trying to figure out what truth is. So how do you help students see that literature can help them understand the perspectives of different people from different places and different times? Well, in a lot of my classes, I look at um, the same idea or the same topic from lots of different angles or perspective, different mm -hmm. authors trying to wrestle with these ideas, um, different works where even the same chapter of the novel, you know, comes from a different character. Um, and so we don't try to look at those yes, no, those true, false questions. We try to kind of grapple with what's the process? Um, what are possible answers? And how do you all disagree? And how do you support, you know, your interpretation of this? Mm -hmm. um, and they, they do come with vastly different ideas. And, but that's, that's the role to kind of coach them through that and to sit back and to, and to listen and get them engaged. I mean, literature is like, you know, a, a good movie, a good painting. Um, a, um, where you can't paraphrase it. You know, you have to be mm -hmm. able to experience and I want them to be able to experience it. Mm -hmm. When you were reading that poem, what struck me was the many layers mm. in the work because I kept noticing the verbs, which I hadn't really noticed as much when mm. I was just reading the poem on the page, but when I heard your voice, I could hear the sounds, mm. and that gave me a different understanding of the poem. And then there were just so many different levels, contemporary music and mm -hmm. ideas from the past, and all of that came together so beautifully yeah, in you. your poem. Do students, have another aha moment when they begin to realize that they can make connections like that on the page. Oh, yes, definitely. And, and one of the reasons I um, you know, encourage them always to be there is because I can't duplicate what goes on in the class. And I can mm -hmm. be teaching the same class you know, at different hours of the day, but because the people are different, you know, and they have these great ideas, and one person says something, and somebody else yeah. jumps off of that. Um, that's a real experience that is unique to that particular class. 
And so mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, kind of epiphanies going on in the classroom or sometimes with what they're writing and brainstorming outside of the classroom and sharing with everyone else. So mm -hmm. that is it's definitely a, a kind of a magical experience it can be. Mm -hmm. so. The writing process involves grappling with perspective. Mm -hmm. And as you have said, there is also the back door and the front door mm. where poems can enter. Talk a little bit about what it means to write and to consider the importance of perspective. Well, I, I do like to tell my students that sometimes a poem comes in th through the front door. I know exactly what I want to write about, and they may experience the same thing. I want to write a poem about X. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes in through the back door. There's a, an image, a metaphor, um, a line that keeps going through my head, and I will discover what I want to write about after I kind of follow that image or that idea. Um, but the perspectives, you know, I teach them to write poems in, as persona poems as, uh, with other people speaking. Not, it's not always the author speaking in a poem, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but I think literature also helps us empathize with others and others empathize with us because we're mm -hmm. trying to look and see and understand how other people see situations, other people who um, may or may not be like us. Mm -hmm. Understanding how other people view the world and how they think is particularly relevant in your previous collection, Local News from Somewhere Else. Mm -hmm. And you have said that that book sort of evolved from the desire to write about family, but then also to acknowledge some of the tragedies that had happened at that time. Yes. I mean, th this book started out as a poem about um, having kids and raising children. And um, it really evolved into, after 9-11, raising children in an unsafe world and trying to define what does safe mean anymore? Mm -hmm. What does home mean anymore? Yeah. Because things have changed so drastically. Um, so there are a lot of poems about headline news. There's, there's, there's poems about 9-11. There are poems about a number of school shootings. Mm -hmm. There are poems about um, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. Um, but then they're interspersed with these poems about family and you know, where do we find our um, hope? Where do we find the sense mm -hmm. of persistence? Um, how do we keep those we love safe? And how do we juggle all of that in today's mm -hmm. world? So. Mm -hmm. Very important ideas to explore. How do you, as a poet, deal with such difficult subject matter and yet keep a sense of hope and perseverance? Hmm. I think some of it is just keep keeping, uh, still coming back to the, to the human. Um, I know um, when I was writing this long poem on 9-11, I wanted to write a poem about the, the plane crash in Somerset County. And I did a lot of um, reading on just newspapers, ac newspaper accounts of the many witnesses. So I start from far away with the, the air traffic controller, and I end um, very close with a mother at the um, first year memorial. Uh, so I had to look at you know how might these individuals be feeling, and how how does that connect to the universal, that very personal to the universal. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the sense of hope. Um, comes in uh, just looking at the sense of, of persistence, uh, the strength of the human spirit, mm -hmm. um, the sense of people pulling together, um, and also hanging on to those good good moments with the family and friends and the people who are close to you. So, mm -hmm. over the course of a semester. Do you notice that your students are becoming more compassionate toward others or more aware of the hmm. connections between people? That's interesting. I th certainly think that the things we talk about in the literature affect um, what they notice in other pieces. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I have great students, so you know. I mean, they're good at relating to each other, anyways. But 
it's wonderful and really exciting to see them just really light up and start making all these connections to not only the different pieces of literature, but things in their lives or other people that they know, and sometimes some very difficult topics. You know, some, mm -hmm. of, some of the students have been through some very hard times, uh, but they're willing to talk about those in terms of the literature and mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, what they've kind of learned from it as well. Mm -hmm. When you were writing your previous book, what did the experience of creating those poems teach you about what it's like to live in an unsafe world? Hmm. I think that it, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that it taught me, or it's maybe still teaching me, to slow down a little bit and to hold on to those really positive moments as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not particularly good at living in the moment, so I'm trying to slow down and, and you know, cherish those um, joyful times as well and those, mm -hmm. um, those times of a community. Um, but it, uh, it also, you know, reminds you of um, all the good things that we give each other, mm -hmm. you know, as well as those really difficult things. Wow, that's a lovely answer. Mm -hmm. When we were talking earlier, you said that people are born with a curiosity to know how things work and why they are the way they are, and that poetry can communicate, mm -hmm. but that communication has to come after you discover what you think about the world. Tell us a little um, bit more about that. Well, I think that writing and teaching is really a process of discovery, and sometimes we find out what we think in that process. Um, so tell me again your, your question. I've forgotten some of it. So. so the idea of poetry communicating, but that first you have to discover what you think about the world. How do you help students understand that discovery process? Or how do you deal with that I'm process? I'm not sure, I'm not, sh maybe I'll, I'll revise that a little bit, mm -hmm. what I said. I don't, I'm not sure that you have to know what you think of the world first. You know, I mm -hmm. think that that's part of the reading process, that you come mm -hmm. into that sometimes, or even the teaching process, and definitely the writing process, that mm -hmm. you know, you may know it at the beginning, and mm -hmm. then it may adjust or it may remain the same, but you may, you know, come to a completely different conclusion at the end. It's certainly a way mm -hmm. for me individually to kind of work out some ideas mm -hmm. and thoughts to kind of really contemplate and meditate about a particular issue or idea or image or even landscape, you know. Mm. So. Well, getting back to your idea of poetry coming in the front door or the back door, mm -hmm. often, the sense of discovery is a real sense of surprise because when you are working on a poem, it can lead you places you didn't expect to go. Yes. And it can make you realize that, oh, I wasn't aware of that connection or I wasn't aware of what was resonating with that particular mm -hmm. image for me. And it's one of the, the best feelings in the world, I think. Um, I mean, that's what I most like about writing is when everything finally comes together. I mean, there are parts that I don't like about it where you're just sitting and trying to get everything to come together and sometimes that happens quickly and sometimes it happens very slowly. Mm -hmm. But that moment where it's kind of like that ah moment again where mm -hmm. things finally just kind of click into place and you start to see all those connections. Oh. Now, your new book really looks at the relationship between education and literature. Mm -hmm. After having written those poems, what do you think is really the higher work or the higher goal of education? The higher I think just the process of, of thinking um, really closely and looking at yourself, looking at others, looking at the world, maybe from, again, different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, and to look at ideas that you may not have uh, faced before, um, and to get people just to um, experiment with ideas and with thoughts that may not have been familiar with them. 
to them mm -hmm. before. So. Another thing you said that I really loved is that you have an awareness that the world is recreated each day. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Well, that, that idea comes from uh, the Hopkins poem and also from Genesis and the idea that the world, you know, every night uh, the sun goes down, every night the sun, com some, the sun comes back up again. But that's also, I think, what happens in a poem, what happens in, mm -hmm. in a piece of literature. There's that sense of a whole world being recreated. Um, I love uh, the quote from the poet Marianne Moore that talks about um, poetry being imaginary gardens with real toads in them. So mm -hmm. you create this whole world, but it is real, you know, mm -hmm. even though you've kind of um, peopled it or frogified it, I guess, with, you know, other um, objects and things. So. Some people say that poetry is a form of secular prayer, uh -huh. and others feel that for them, poetry is an act of faith. It's an act mm -hmm. of belief. What is poetry for you in that regard? I think that poetry in some ways is very similar to prayer. I don't think it is the same thing as prayer, but I definitely think there's that sense of transcendence that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a sense of transformation from the beginning of a poem to the end, or same thing with a story. You have to be moving from one realm, in some ways one world, to another world. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's that, that wonderful sense that, that takes place. And it's a chance to meditate um, mm -hmm. in a different way. Um, I know that you and I talked a little bit about poetry being both about uh, precision, you know, having mm -hmm. the exact right word in the mm -hmm. right place, and perspective always coming um, from a slightly different angle, so you're avoiding cliches. So you're kind of contemplating, um, looking at things, meditating on things in a new way hopefully. Mm. So. I like what you said about transcendence being mm -hmm. part of poetry because I think for many readers that is what draws them over and over mm -hmm. is the fact that a poem can give them a sense that there is something beyond what we see, mm -hmm. something beyond this world. There is that possibility for transcendence. Mm -hmm. and. In a way, education does the same thing because it gives us the opportunity to transcend our current ideas. Yes, or you're current. becoming larger mm -hmm. than yourself. Exactly. And expanding kind of your world in many ways. You mm -hmm. know? Okay. The new book, True, False, None of the Above, if there is one idea that you would like readers to take away from that collection, mm -hmm. what would it be? I. I think really the sense that there is that um, sense of transcendence and almost that uh, the spiritual aspect of literature and that it deals with these overarching struggles of who we are, almost like the overarching struggles of the soul um, mm -hmm. inherent in, in most literature. No matter what conclusion the characters come to, mm -hmm. there's that kind of tension inside um, that uh, really draws us into the poem or the story or the play. Mm -hmm. so. That's a good point because I think many people look to poetry because they are struggling with those questions and the sense of identity. Yeah. But there is also that sense of transcendence. Mm -hmm. So it and it, joy and yes. humor. I mean, it, yes. you know, it can. Mm -hmm. It's a wide range of topics. You know, nothing is is um, off limits. So. Exactly. We are almost at the end of our time, so would you read another poem? Okay, and is there one in particular that you would like? You can choose. Okay. Um, well, I'll read one then from uh, local news. And this is a poem that, um, as you may remember, um, about a year after 9 11, we had the Kew Creek uh, mine disaster. And everyone was just so, so ready for something positive. And so when there was this rescue, um, and the headlines were nine alive with a big exclamation point, there was, I think, just this national sigh of relief um, on that level, in addition to just the, the personal level um, being so worried about these, these miners. Nine alive, 
Newspaper headline, Somerset, PA. This is the popular miracle we bow down to, a gasp in the throats of thousands ready to weep, disbelief finally synonymous with relief, and not that dark mine of tragedy that keeps collapsing around this tunnel of a country. But there are other wonders, too, untelevised, deeper down, the tap, tap, tapping of what is left of our breath, hungry for spirit, that canary not yet dead in our damp labyrinth, the way we long for light, for even a candle glow of rejoicing, for what was once lost, alive, still alive, our pulse mutters, trying to pray. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank and it ties in so well with everything we discussed. Hmm. Thank you Good. for Thank sharing you. your insights and your words. Thank you very much. Are you worried about letting your child take the wheel? Maybe you should also be worried about what you're doing behind the wheel. Have you ever sent a quick text just this once? Well, that might turn into a catastrophic accident. Monkey see what monkey do. If you do it, why wouldn't your child? In a child's brain, almost all things their parents do, they can do too. 78% of teen drivers' surveys text and drive. 59% said their parents do it too. Stop texting and driving because if you do it, your child will too. Hi, my name is Margie Wiggin, and I want to invite you to join me for my new show, Character Matters, on HCAM. We're going to talk about why do people choose the behavior that they choose? Why do they choose to be good? We're going to hear from people in history. We're going to hear from local heroes who make great choices. And we're going to hear from some puppets who talk about things they've seen, and they're going to say, what? Did you see that? Yes, I did. Please join us.